Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Fall River Symphony Orchestra uh, presentation, uh, first winter presentation. Uh, we have some great music for you this afternoon and a beautiful afternoon it is. Thank you for coming and sharing with us. Um, why are we here? Let's, let's kind of just jump in here. Uh, my name is Douglas McRae Daniels. Uh, many of you know me as Ray Daniels. I'm the music director of the Fall River Symphony Orchestra. And the Fall River Symphony Orchestra uh, has a long reputation of providing high quality uh, music and culture uh, and events uh, for our community. Um, and this year, we were challenged by our condition to continue that tradition um, in, in innovative ways. And our presentation today is a part of that. Um, for the 2021 season, we will be bringing to you um, a series of music that we call uh, Composers of African Descent. Uh, this um, year, we've, uh, as, as a, globally, we've gone through a lot. And um, art um, is a reflection of life. And um, as we are being innovative to um, adhere to our calling and do this type of work, here we are making this presentation for you. Um, why, why, why this music? Why now? Well, that's a good question. Um, um, we saw our planet come to a standstill. And when that standstill happened, we saw some pretty brutal things happen. And, um, and I and my organization, Fall River Symphony, we're reacting to it as well as other organizations around our country and our world. Uh, and, and one of the things that I've noticed is the lack of representation of composers of African descent on the concert stage, those that are small and large. And so we are here to present to you some of that uh, music and those artists today and this entire season. Um, our program really has three um, particular components. We are here to, first of all, acknowledge this work and the uh, artistic contributions of these composers. Secondly, we want to educate ourselves and our audience, um, in particular, bringing some historical relevance and also um, what kinds of influence has uh, happened because of this, these composers and this music. And lastly, we want to experience it. We would love to uh, bring to you in your homes live performances and which is what we're doing here uh, as we are broadcasting live uh, from the Narrows in Fall River. Um, we have been so lucky to be able to collaborate um, with several partners dur during our um, season. The Narrows uh, is a fantastic venue and they have also adapted to our current conditions. Uh, another uh, such collaboration uh, it is my colleague and good friend, um, Ashley Gordon, and uh, she is here uh, today to, and for the rest of the season, thank goodness, um, to present to you some of this great work. Uh, Ashley is one of the co-founders of Castle of Our Skins. Uh, she's also the artistic director, and uh, she's a fantastic violist. And I'm just very happy to have her here today. Um, welcome. Ashley, and can you just tell everybody a little bit about yourself and what have you been doing lately? <laughs> sure. Thanks so much for having me here. I'm uh, excited to be back for part two. I very much enjoyed part one in the fall. Um, as, as you mentioned, I'm a violist, artistic executive director of Castle of Our Skins, concert, concert and educational series dedicated to really celebrating um, and amplifying history and voices, past, present, um, and eventually future as it relates to Black culture and the music of Black composers. Um, what have I been doing? That's that's a, a big question. Since last time we, we connected, um, there has been no shortage on our plate of virtual programming, whether it's educational workshops or recording sessions or live streamed concerts. Uh, so that definitely has been in full swing very much in January and especially this month of February and um, plotting and planning as, as we like to do best. So really trying to build out our team, bringing on new staff, 
um, envisioning our future. Our 10th anniversary is not too far off. So lots of planning ahead um, that I can't tell too much about because it's still in the works, but lots of planning ahead. Well, I have to say, uh, I'm extremely impressed with the work that you have been doing, your, you and your organization, and um, it's, 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 it's tireless work. I see you uh, and, and your organization always forging ahead and uh, doing great things. So um, I am very happy uh, that you are, are here uh, with us here in Fall River, continuing that work. Lots of stuff to listen to today and to do and to learn and to experience. So let's jump in here. Um, last, in, in November, when we did our first um, episode, our first presentation, we talked about one of the great events that kind of shaped um, that time period. Uh, and it is the Seven Years War. Um, uh, Winston Churchill called it the real first uh, world war. It was a global uh, conflict. and. It started in the Ohio River Basin with the French coming from Canada, um, trying to settle in North America. And, and, and um, the governor of Virginia sent a little spy to go and check and see what was going on. That spy was 21, 22-year-old George Washington. Uh, as he was spying and checking things out, um, there was a little scrimmage on the way back and uh, a French diplomat was killed. Um, in Europe, there were allies and things happening and all of a sudden the world um, ended up in a war. And um, the big um, components in this war was France and Great Britain. Our first composer, Chevalier du Saint George, uh, um, lived during that time. And um, I think a lot of um, what was going on during that day was very significant uh, to his life. So let's jump in just to find out a little bit about him. Um, his name, his birth name, uh, Joseph Bologna. Uh, he was born on Christmas Day, 19, I'm oh, sorry, 1745. In a, on a little island called Guadalupe in the Caribbean. Um, now, his father, George, uh, was a married, wealthy um, landowner. His wife had a slave. Her name was Anne Nenon. Uh, Nenon. Uh, I, I'm not quite sure how to pronounce her, her name. But um, they had a relationship. And out of that relationship um, was born Joseph. Um, his son, uh, our Chevalier du Saint George. Um, when he was two, his father George, who was the landowner, was accused of murder, and uh, the family fled the island and went to France. Um, and they were there for two years until he was exonerated and he was acquitted of this charge. It was it was an unjust charge. They moved back. And for several years, um, they were on the plantation. And eventually, um, in 1753, uh, just a few years before the um, Seven Year War started, uh, George Bologna uh, sent his son to France to study. There, he excelled. Um, he was one of these um, super personalities, these super types. Uh, he, 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 in one particular area he sell, excelled in was fencing. Um, he became uh, a really diligent um, fencer. Um, he was challenged to a, a, a little duel. Um, uh, he was called um, a, a mulatto upstart uh, by uh, a master fencer um, by the name of Alexander Picard. Uh, not to be confused with Captain Picard of the Starship Enterprise. He was also a French. So <laughs> um, this fencing match happened, and Bologna won this fencing match, and he kind of got, got, got a little status. Um, he graduated when he was 19, and um, he did get a title. His father actually um, gained a title of nobility shortly before that. He became uh, a gentleman in the king's chamber. 
Um, but because of the black code, the, the black laws in France, his son um, could not be part of the nobility. Um, but he did get a title. Uh, he became the Chevalier, uh, which is uh, um, kind of like the French uh, knighthood or the chivalrous one. Um, so uh, they were from the island of Guadalupe, and the property was called um, uh, um, the, the the property uh, was um, called Saint George. So he adopted the name, or he became Chevalier de Saint George, as oftentimes he's referred to. Uh, a lot happened after that, but uh, I'm going to bring in uh, Ashley to help us out and to um, let's talk a little bit about um, some of the, the work um, that he did. Sure. Yeah. Thanks so much for this. Um, I wanted to uh, highlight a little bit more about what you said with the Code Noir, which was um, a, a whole slew of rules and regulations, pretty pretty monstrous rules and regulations enacted by King Louis Fourteenth in 1685, and it definitely affected uh, uh, jo jo Joseph when he was in Guadalupe. Um, one, of, one of the rules stated that if, um, among many other rules, if a child is born uh, to an enslaved person, an, an enslaved woman, I should say, and uh, the master is uh, the father, then, then that child is an enslaved person. So Joseph was born an enslaved person uh, and normally what would happen is that the, the master, the father would, would have a penalty. He would be absolved from, from all responsibility uh, in terms of fatherhood and care of, of that child. And uh, George de Boulogne, uh, Joseph's father, actually really was quite unorthodox and defied that rule and took uh, his legitimate wife, his legitimate daughter, uh, Anne, Nanon, and uh, Joseph as one family to France. Um, George Bologna had um, access to nobility from prior when he was in Guadalupe, uh, was befriended to the king of, of France. So he actually had quite a, quite a bit of stature when he came to France. And while uh, Joseph has African ancestry, uh, George, the father, was able to really provide him a, a pretty privileged life of near nobility. So yes, he was able to, to go into the school as and learn fencing, learn Latin, learn German, learn uh, dance. He was known for being quite quite a dancer and uh, very athletic, as you said, with fencing and with swimming and all sorts of things, uh, and certainly with music. Um, as uh, a member of sort of the high uh, aristocratic um, uh, nobility in France, uh, George, the father, had been patrons to composers and to other musicians. So he was able to have the top French composer, um, Leclerc, be the, 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 the uh, teacher of Joseph de Bologna, as well as uh, Gossick, for instance, to be in his circle. So there was, there was lots of um, paths opened because of a unorthodox father, actually, who was going against the, the Code Noir that had been enacted by King Louis the the Fourteenth um, in in France? What I think is really interesting with Chevalier is he was um, a, a man of many many skills, as you already talked about with fencing. He was an accomplished violinist. He was an accomplished harpsichordist. Um, he ended up being the concertmaster of uh, Gossick's orchestra, and eventually when Gossick resigned from that orchestra, became the conductor of that orchestra. He taught Marie, Queen Marie Antoinette uh, music and had uh, probably too close for comfort relationship for a lot of people to her. She had wanted him to be uh, the director of the Paris Opera and some of the, the musicians said that they would not bend to the orders uh, and directions of an African descended person. They didn't use the word African descended person, but the idea was very much there. Um, so he ended up uh, being quite stricken by that, but ended up creating another orchestra that had something like 12 bases or something like this. I don't even know orchestras now that have that many bases. Uh, and commissioning and premiering Haydn's, all six Haydn's Paris symphonies. Like any other violinist really and composer at the time, he ended up writing a lot of music to show off his, his you know, virtuosic prowess. So um, he wrote violin 
concertos, he wrote violin sonatas, he wrote violin string quartets of which we'll hear, which had really often the sort of solo line in the first violin part for him to play and a, kind of a little bit of a backup band. He was really a pioneer of the Sinfonia Concertant model, which had sort of soloist group with a, a larger chamber ensemble. Uh, we might think of Mozart uh, who wrote one, uh, the, the Duo Concertante, uh, Chevalier wrote 10 that, that predated uh, Mozart. And if, if that weren't enough to add other chamber works and operas to his name, he was also uh, the, uh, a leader of an all black regiment in the French revolution. So many, many um, accolades to his name and really a, a really fantastic uh, person. One other thing that I'll share before I think we'll listen to some music is uh, a, a bit about his legacy. So he was, he was born an enslaved person in Guadeloupe in France, um, slavery wasn't nearly as harsh as it was on the colonies. And again, with his uh, noble access through his father, he was afforded quite, quite a lot of opportunities. Um, shortly before his, his death, uh, a few years before his death, uh, Napoleon had come to rise and Haitian revolution, speaking about the, the context in the world was also going around. So Toussaint Louverture overthrowing the French and becoming a free, um, a free first free black um, country. And um, all, of, all of the accolades that, that Chevalier de Saint-Georges had, had amassed being performed and really well um, ended up really being cut off by Napoleon who three years after Chevalier's death it reenacted some of those code noirs in the, in the colonies and really brought back slavery um, to the point where Chevalier was not allowed on concert stages. He was not allowed, re literally removed, erased from uh, concert uh, descriptions and from history books, that kind of thing. Um, and is one that is sort of getting a bit of a resurgence now, but very, very confused. Um, I, I had mentioned Mozart earlier, Chevalier de Saint-Georges is, is given this moniker in relationship to Mozart, the black Mozart or something like this. Um, he predated Mozart by 11 years. He wrote, as I mentioned, 10 Sinfonia Concertants before Mozart. He was, he was the influencer here. <laughs> he, he, was the, he was the influencer. Mozart borrowed passages of, of his work and included it in, in his own. Um, there's, I, I won't even tell you of the children's books that use that name and uh, plays that use that name and a new movie that had referenced that name that isn't even created yet, it's in the works. But in any case, he has so much merit on his own as you'll hear and upcoming in his music and also with his story. Yeah, yeah, it's, 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 it's really interesting. We could go on about these composers and on and we totally understand, we actually were talking just before we started today that um, we will certainly not be able to give you uh, a thorough, um, uh, anything near justice about these composers, but it is an introduction. Um, so let's, let's listen to some of this music. Uh, so the piece that we're gonna listen to um, right now it is called uh, Sonata for Harp and Flute. Uh, it's in the E flat. It would be performed by two members of the Fall River Symphony Orchestra on harp, Erlen Mitchell, and flute is De Deborah uh, Kelchner. Thank you. 
So Ashley, one of the things that um, is really spectacular about doing this series is that our orchestra players get to play chamber music, which is fantastic. So in, in playing chamber music, as you well know, is a totally different experience than being in a 100-piece orchestra um, playing. So um, we, we are all getting a wonderful experience here. Um, they did a fantastic job. George Bridge Tower, our next guy. Um, let's talk about him. Who was he? And um, wow, another very spicy story. Yes, very, very spicy indeed. And this one is filled with lots of drama, as I think any, um, I don't know, any historical figure, you can always find some, some, some dirt, I guess, on them. But he definitely had lots of, lots of drama. There's um, not a great deal of information around him and more anecdotal sort of storytelling largely spearheaded by, by his father. So there's accounts with George Augustus Paul Green Bridge Tower being born in Poland in 1779 to an African descended father and a Polish mother. Some accounts place his birth in the English colonies and his father being of Barbadian and English descent, his mother being of Astro German, Austrian uh, and German descent. Um, his father, there's, there's accounts of him talking in great elaborate detail about his African ancestry and uh, great grandfathers and sort of all, all the sensationalism that he was known for. He was quite a character. Um, and his father was really one who spearheaded a lot of the drama in George Bridge Tower's life, um, parading him all around Europe and exploiting his prodigious and, and virtuoso son, um, taking the money, exploiting that money, not sending it back home to family, that kind of thing. So George, uh, Bridge Tower was uh, seen as a child prodigy, a violinist who was said to have studied with Joseph Haydn, uh, wowing audiences when he was 10, um, as early as 10 with his violin playing. He also comes from uh, a musical family. His brother, uh, Frederick Joseph, was also a cellist and they have performed concerts together, uh, Beethoven Eroica. There's an account of them performing in the same orchestra, for instance, and um, also performing on tours. Uh, George, however, would go on tours and thinking again about sort of the, the nature of this time in the late 1700s, 1779 he was born, there's certainly much more restrictions around um, people traveling, especially a black person or African descended person traveling around Europe. So some of his travels, especially to France, ended up becoming uh, more regulated, but on tours with his father, he would perform for the Prince of Wales, King George III, other prestigious uh, patrons of the arts. And um, it took quite a bit of coercion, but Prince Regent, who later became uh, King George IV of England, was able to convince George's sensational father to leave him in his care and not further exploit him um, and provide for, for himself, Prince Regent, music theory lessons, having George perform in his band, uh, being a patron as, as other patrons of the time, think about Haydn, for instance, who had a, the, the Esterhazys, um, being able to support his musical development, development and um, musical career. So regular salary, um, additional traveling opportunities, obviously musical connections. Um, so this, this was, again, a time where um, patronage, system was, was sort of well, well known, but it was also a time where agency was also um, taken into effect. So Bridge Tower eventually would rise to his own accord as a musician and an educator and a composer and not no longer need the patronage of, of Prince Regent. So earning his bachelor's of music at the University of Cambridge, for instance, in 1811, uh, being an educator and publishing a, a set of piano pieces for his students in 1812 called Diatonica Armonica. Um, other works uh, that we've known have survived, um, his violin concerto, two books of minuets, I think, for violin, mandolin, German flute, and harpsichord. So speaking of chamber music, round up your friends. And other vocal um, and chamber works, which I think we'll get to hear this afternoon, right? That's right. We're, we're, we're actually, we'll, we'll um, play some right now. And it's interesting, <clears throat> I, I feel like I read somewhere where his both of his parents were in service and they may have met in, um, if they didn't meet in the Esterhauser um, court, they lived there soon after he was born. So I just can imagine um, living in a, in a space where Haydn was inventing symphonies mm -hmm. and um, 
um, being and, and growing up and being a violinist. It's, it's amazing. It's a fantastic story. Um, this piece that we're about to hear is probably his most famous piece. Uh, at least it's, it's one of his most well-known pieces. It is um, for mezzo and piano. It is called It is called Henry. We have uh, uh, Ariella Rogers performing um, uh, the vocal part, and our very own Judith Conrad playing the piano. Um, uh, you will find uh, bios of all of our performers on our website. And so now here we are. Um, this wonderful dramatic aria, Henry. Been on Zoom almost a year now, I still forget about the mute button. That was amazing, um, and it was so powerful. And it's such a funny little piece. Um, uh, Miss Rogers did a fantastic job, and also Miss Conrad. Um, thank you both for that wonderful performance. Um, Bridge Tower, uh, 
great career, but he met some big names. Uh, he, he was in cahoots with um, Beethoven and others. Uh, talk to us a little bit about that. Sure. So um, before the cahoots happened, there was lots of friendship. Uh, and because, again, of his patronage with Prince Regent, uh, George ended up traveling quite quite a bit. Um, there was his his family, his mother, for instance, he wanted to see and, and sort of visit and have an extended stay, ended up finding himself in Vienna and meeting the patron of, of Beethoven, which sort of seven aspects removed of Kevin Kevin Bacon, whatever that is, he was able to connect with uh, Bacon. Six, six degrees of separation or something? Six degrees of separation, there we go. Um, so in any case, long story short, uh, he and Beethoven met, had mutual um, fondness for each other's craft. Uh, Beethoven wrote in 1803 uh, Sonata for him, which is now known as the Kreutzer Sonata, although Kreutzer actually did not play the piece and did not actually want to play the piece. Uh, his opus, I believe 47, is, is the Sonata for Violin and for uh, Piano. And uh, Beethoven was hastily working on it, literally up until uh, the premiere of which Beethoven performed at the piano and uh, George Bridge Tower performed on violin. Uh, in, in their rehearsals, I think, uh, George Bridge Tower ended up improvising a little bit, heard something in the piano and improvised and Beethoven was so smitten uh, that he gave him his, you know, tuning fork. Oh, great chap, whatever. You know, this is this is so amazing. Uh, and really impressed by his by his prow prowess and his musical ability. Um, at that premiere, uh, again in, in 1803, you have uh, the, uh, Prince Esterhazy, who we had mentioned before, being a patron of Haydn, a Russian diplomat and friend of Beethoven, Count Razumovs Razumovsky, uh, and uh, British ambassador. So it was uh, an opportunity to rub many elbows and really be seen as a um, collaborating mu musician. Uh, Beethoven did originally uh, inscribe this to be uh, what he called Mulatto Sonata, which, uh, sonat Sonatica, I believe, which was an oddly term of endearment, not used in a derogatory way at, given their relationship at the time. Um, and then some squabble over a woman <laughs> being Beethoven and being quite uh, temperamental uh, ended up, okay, I'm gonna remove this, this dedication to who, who was my good friend and collaborator who I literally premiered this piece with uh, and call it the Kreitzer Sonata whom Beethoven had never met. And again, Kreitzer was not particularly a fan of. So now we have immortalized in history, this, this uh, monstrous piece of music dedicated to the wrong person uh, and, and with no acknowledgement or often very little acknowledgement of for whom it was actually written. Yeah, I, I remember reading stories where um, Bridge Tower would look over his shoulder and he would play this piece. And um, I mean, this is like pre-Paganini, so he was he was a true virtuoso, uh, an, an amazing um, artist. Um, well, uh, we do have another Bridgewater piece, uh, Bridge Tower. I keep missing that up. <laughs> Bridge Tower piece. Uh, here is an arrangement of Jubilee. Uh, um, there are lots of patriotic tunes arranged by various artists. And of course, uh, here we have a set of variations uh, as such. It is arranged here for flute and string quartet.
Quartet uh, and also assistant professor of violin at the University of Texas uh, at uh, San Antonio. Uh, she was supposed to be with us here today, but as you know, that Texas is um, frozen right about now and um, wasn't, she wasn't quite sure she would be able to join us. Uh, how did you meet her, by the way? Sure, there's um, all sorts of clubs and sort of circles that I, I am involved with on behalf of Cast Lover Skins, one of which is through Facebook, a uh, group of black composers having a Facebook page. And uh, on behalf of another colleague who is also searching for some George Bridge Tower music, put out a general post, can anyone help me uh, in researching and trying to find this music? That led to uh, Dr. Nicole Cherry and many pleasant conversations, largely by email at this point and uh, soon to connect via Zoom and uh, have sort of face-to-face -face time. But her music and her scholarship, uh, I, I have gotten to know more about um, and am excited as a, a fellow research nerd to learn who else is in this uh, arena doing, doing the work and has been in this arena doing the work. It's amazing. I I, we were talking earlier about, um, you know, I, I'll even use an I statement uh, for myself, um, going to conservatory and doing my undergraduate work, um, I never uh, had the opportunity to dig into this repertoire. Uh, it was never presented to me and I've had to discover it and dig for it myself. And I found a new world of scholars uh, who are doing this type of work. I found a new world of literature. And it is exciting to know that there are people that look like me doing this type of work, studying people that look like me. So uh, I'm thrilled to, to actually be a part of that. Um, so uh, that being said, Samuel Coolidge Taylor, how delicious. Oh, yes. 1875, he was born in August. Um, when, I, when I often um, do research, especially when I'm teaching, I always tell my students, just look at the year from which he was uh, someone, whoever we're studying, was born. And that can kind of really kind of get you settled into the time period. And this is a very important year. Um, so this is 10 years after the Civil War. Uh, uh, in October of this year was uh, the premiere of uh, Tchaikovsky's Piano Concerto No. 1. Uh, it was given in Boston um, and Hans von Bülow performing. There, the, the first college football um, tournament, first, first college football game happened in Massachusetts this year. Uh, Tufts versus Harvard. That happened this year, <laughs> 1875. What was really significant that happened this year was the passing of the Civil Rights Act. Now, the, the, this bill, um, which was signed into law uh, by Ulysses Grant in, on March 1st, was, to, was designed to protect all citizens and um, uh, their, for the, with their civil rights uh, and legal rights, and it provided them uh, equal treatment uh, in public accommodations and public transportations and prohibited uh, exclusion from serving on juries. That was the crust of this Civil Rights Act. Amazing. Because what happened after that was crazy. I mean, this is, this is all of the stuff that led up to uh, Plessy versus Ferguson, separate per, um, um, but equal, um, you know, uh, when 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 African Americans tried to exercise their new rights, it wasn't happening. Lynchings started to happen. All sorts of um, 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 political coercions and things started to happen. It uh, there were protests, and this made its way up to the Supreme Court. 1883, the court ruled the. The, the law unconstitutional. Yeah, that happened. And that's, that, that, it's amazing that this was the very time happening because uh, Samuel Coolidge Taylor did three tours in the United States. And a great friend of his, W.E.B. Du Bois, um, 
uh, they, they were collaborators, they were colleagues. And uh, Samuel Coolidge Taylor was a great inspiration for many Americans. And, um, you know, he had humble beginnings um, uh, in England, in London. Um, his father uh, studied to be a doctor. Uh, he, he moved back to Sierra Leone, where he was from. His mother, um, she was pregnant when she was 18. Um, the father moved back before, it, it, and he didn't know that uh, he had a child on the way. And the story um, takes off. So help us out, Ashley. Sure. Um, I, I think it's interesting with, with that story. Uh, he was really raised by his, his mother, this, this English woman, as well as her mother, the, the mother's parents, right? His grandparents. Um, and really his, his grandfather, I, I think, becomes a, a powerful paternal figure in his life, providing a really warm and safe environment um, as, as well as being his first musical teacher, right? Providing him uh, with violin lessons. Uh, Samuel Coolidge Taylor was able in school to sing and really show a lot of musical aptitude, um, saved up his own earnings to buy a very basic piano, basically a box with some strings on it um, and teach himself and learn uh, and show his curiosity around music skills and music theory. He was encouraged to enroll at the Royal, Royal College of Music at the uh, tender age of 15, when it was about 40 pounds to enroll in studies at the time. Uh, and he enrolled as a violinist and uh, about two years into his studies switched to composition. Uh, there's a, a story that is a vivid image in my mind of one of his pieces as a composer being performed by the school orchestra with um, Gustav Holt playing trombone on the piece and way back in the percussion section, uh, Rafan Williams playing triangle on Samuel Coach Taylor's piece. He was in this neo-romantic um, English sound world. Um, during, during his time there had many influences as, as you can imagine. And uh, again, him being really receptive to those influences. Another one of the influences you had referenced W.E.B. Du Bois was um, really a sense of Pan-Africanism, having this shared sense of uh, African heritage, African cultural uh, values among black people spread throughout the diaspora. So yes, civil war in the States and yes, Supreme Court in the States, but he felt those things. Um, again, having this sort of shared sense of solidarity. So he would connect, as you mentioned with W.E.B. Du Bois, he would um, have the preface of his 24 Negro Melodies written by Booker T. Washington. He would um, set the poems of Paul Lawrence Dunbar into beautiful songs, right? And um, he would become the, the leading delegate at the first Pan-African conference in London in, in 1900, uh, which really helped pave the way 60 years later for the American civil rights um, movement. He was also incredibly influenced by African-American spirituals. He heard them through performers like Fisk Jubilee singers when they were on tour in England and felt this shared, again, sense of solidarity with African-American plight and with the plight of indigenous peoples um, as well. Um, all, all of that just sort of married in, into his body of work, which is over 80 pieces. Um, one of my favorite, his epic 30 minute super indulgent clarinet quintet that he wrote to rival Brahms, his grand choral work, Hiawatha, which is in three parts with full orchestra and um, really does still stand as his most celebrated work. During his lifetime, it rivaled Mendelssohn's Elijah Handel's uh, Messiah. Um, he was also published during his lifetime by the Novello, company whose founder ironically studied with George Bridgetower, who we just heard, uh, but he, um, Samuel Coach Taylor received little earnings from his sales, which helped launch the formation of the Performing Rights Society, uh, where composers would collect royalties for his music. Um, so his, his legacy and his life is just so amazing. And during his time, as you said, such a, a beacon of hope and for possibility for Black Americans. Um, really, when he came on his tours to the States, 
he was seen as as yeah as a as a hero and celebrated there was um literally a a choir named after him he got to go to the white house and meet president roosevelt um and was able to really um take take a sense of idea of what freedom could look like and actualize it uh, for black Americans who had Jim Crow and segregation and reconstruction remnants and just all sorts of reincarnated atrocities being thrown at them. So a, a real pioneering uh, man who, who had a lot of legacy and a lot of um, honor, I think, to his name. Yeah, I mean, what an amazing story. The the choir in D.C. was a 200 voice choir, um, became the George Bridge, uh, sorry, the Samuel Coolidge Taylor Society and um, uh, just phenomenal. And I just remember reading how uh, African-Americans so embraced um, his success as a vision. Uh, W.E.B. Du Bois um, uh, and I'm, I'm not going to quote him directly because I will mess it up. But it, to, it was to the faction of um, if you take the shackles of Jim Crow off of um, African uh, Americans, this is the level of success that is possible. Um, so it was it was it was that was a symbiotic relationship. He was totally inspired by the African Americans and African Americans African Americans saw him as a beacon of hope and a beacon of light. Um, just um, such a, a, an amazing story. We're, we're going to hear this this great piece, Fantasy Struck. Um, it is a, um, a a string quartet in five movements. It's unbelievable. We're going to bring it to you in its entirety. It's about 20 minutes long, um, but it's an unbelievable piece. And our string quartet loves it. Here it is.
That mute button, yes. <laughs> Fantastic piece. Um, the colors, just the, 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 the feel, the mood. Um, I just am so happy to, to actually be able to experience uh, hearing that work of art. And I just wanna add a couple of, just a, a little tag note. <clears throat> he had two children. One was named after his most um, famous piece, um, Hiawatha, uh, who died in 1980. And uh, he had a, a daughter, Avril, who died in 1998. And um, she was a pretty famous conductor, uh, composer. Uh, she was uh, frequently a guest conductor of the BBC Orchestra and the London Symphony Orchestra. Uh, interestingly enough, um, uh, she presented um, white, and she, and she performed in South Africa for quite some time until they found out that her father was from Sierra Leone. And then her career ended in performance because she was no longer allowed to perform there because of the code noir of South Africa. Great concert. Um, Miss Gordon, thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure. Thanks so much for having me. And I uh, want to, uh, again, thank our partners here at the Narrows, at this fantastic venue where we can broadcast live and to bring you, our audience, um, uh, this wonderful uh, programming and music. Um, please like and subscribe to our um, YouTube uh, channel um, and um, also to our members from the Fall River Symphony Orchestra. Thank you all for putting your time in and, and playing with us today. Uh, we have our next concert in a couple of weeks, March 9th, I do believe it is. And um, we look forward to seeing you then. Until then, peace. <laughs>